Professor David Cardwell's pioneering work embodies the University of Warwick's ethos of making a real-world difference. Professor Cardwell is a Warwick alumnus. He came to study here in the 1980s and left with a degree in physics and a PhD in inelastic gamma-ray scattering. After leaving Warwick, he took up a place at the research industrial laboratory Plessy Caswell, which later became part of BAE Systems. Here, he was introduced to superconducting materials, and he started his extraordinary career. Professor Cardwell moved to the University of Cambridge in 1992 to further his research into superconductors. He's now one of the preeminent figures investigating the immense potential for these materials. Their potential impact on the realms of energy, transport, health and more is enormous. David now leads the Bulk Superconductivity Research Group at Cambridge, which has made significant advancements in superconductor activity. These include generating the highest magnetic field ever recorded in a superconductor. He's a founding member of the European Society of Applied Superconductivity, which set up in 1998. He established and led the successful European Forum on Bulk Superconductivity between 2002 and 2008. He's presented at over 60 international conferences and is an active board member of five international journals. As of late last year, Professor Cardwell was additionally tasked with leading one of the world's top-ranked engineering departments. He was appointed as the University of Cambridge's head of the Department of Engineering. Today, Professor David Cardwell receives an honorary Doctor of Science from the University of Warwick. Congratulations, David, on your uh, honorary degree. Thank um, you. You're, of course, a, a Warwick uh, alumnus. What does um, this award mean to you? Uh, well, as, as I said in my acceptance speech, really, it's the icing on the cake. So I uh, spent a lot of time here, six years, two degrees, formative scientific years of my life. Um, no idea what to expect when I left. But looking back, my time at Warwick uh, facilitated it all. So, um, as I said, this is the icing on the cake. And I'm uh, extremely proud to have been selected for an honorary degree. I feel slightly unworthy, but there you go. And as you say, yeah, you studied your undergraduate degree and PhD here at, at Warwick. What kind of place was the university at that time? Well, it was different and similar. Um, so the general geographic kind of footprint um, was not as extensive as it is now. And there's lots of new buildings. Basically, things in white were here when I was here. Things which were in colours other than white weren't. So um, obviously, there have been major developments at, over at the Roots building. The union's not uh, changed too much internally, but there are bits that are unrecognisable. Uh, the campus is now sprawling. Uh, way back in 1986, uh, it wasn't. Uh, the medical school wasn't here then. Uh, the Jack Martin residences weren't there then. It was simply one or two uh, well-defined but well-used residences, not the state-of-the-art accommodation that the university has now. So it's it's boomed both in terms of its academic offerings and the quality of the buildings that it now kind of presents to students. So, you know, very encouraging for me to look back and see how well Warwick's done since uh, I left. And how about particularly in terms of your fields of, of science and engineering? Yeah. How, has it, how has it changed? So science and engineering, uh, the core basically stays the same. It doesn't change very much. But I think attitude towards science and engineering has changed. Um, I think science now is seen as facilitating. Engineering is seen as delivering. And I think they work together extremely well. And the fact that my degrees are in physics, but now I head a department of engineering, speaks volumes. I think is very relevant to that question. So, you know, physics absolutely is a transferable subject within physical sciences. Um, and the education work provided me, I'm living proof that that's fit for purpose and uh, you know, I can now move on or did move on to other universities and other disciplines. And after leaving Warwick, um, you were working at an industrial research laboratory and then you moved to the University of Cambridge. What encouraged you to move from industry to academia? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think when I finished my PhD, a lot of my colleagues and peers were going to take postdocs. I kind of really wanted to work in industry. I'd worked on and off part-time in industry, but it seemed to me to be right for me at the time. Uh, so I was in an industry for six and a half years, and I think that was just about enough. Um, in the interim period, I actually worked for the Open University as a tutor counsellor or a lecturer, and that kind of kept my interest in academia going and alive. 
um, and it just seemed to be the natural transition. Uh, the way it happened was very unexpected. I got a call um, from Cambridge and uh, I'd worked in superconductivity in industry, so that gave me the opportunity. But then the call came from the university, which was very unexpected. And uh, as you say, as we say, the rest is history. But at the time, lots of academics were moving into industry. So I was kind of swimming against the, the tide, really. And uh, it raised a few eyebrows, but it was the best decision I've ever taken. And looking back at your career, has it surprised you um, or did you have a, a clear idea of what you wanted to do when you graduated? That's another good question. Um, I think um, almost to my shame, I've never planned anything. When I speak to young people, I tell them they should plan. So kind of do as I say, not do as I did. But uh, I never actually planned a single thing. Um, I seem to have stumbled from one thing to another. It's absolutely true that I've been in the right place at the right time on a number of occasions. Um, there's not some kind of deep-rooted, amazing ability here that would have shone through regardless. Um, superconductivity was discovered you know, within four months of me joining industry. It was a materials lab. I got a PhD in physics. I knew about superconductivity. All the stars were aligned perfectly. It was like winning the lottery, really. And, uh, and even then, the subject then developed, and I developed with it, and then Cambridge had this opportunity and it had uh, a desire to employ me and ever since I joined Cambridge my treatment's been exceptional uh, I have nothing to complain about um, but I never once did I think one day I want to be head of department one day I want to be a professor it just never happened I just took one thing at a time and and I'm actually quite surprised looking back that I am where I am to be honest and uh, I'm not quite sure how it happened but I'm sure it did somewhere along the line. And you talk a bit about your research research there um, in, in superconductor materials and uh, that's made great advances already and there's still huge potential for the future. What excites you particularly about that area of research? So superconductivity is traditionally a difficult area to apply because it, superconductors operate at low temperatures and the challenge is actually getting a material that we can apply widely in well-recognized applications. MRI is one but it's a bit of a niche expensive application uh, the materials we make potentially could find homes in more conventional devices, things like energy storage systems, things like motors and generators, magnetic separators, um, devices that, that are fairly easy to understand rather than being kind of niche, bespoke, expensive bits of equipment. And superconductivity and bulk superconductivity is getting to the stage where those applications are realisable and over the next five years I expect some real commercial gains to be made by taking these materials and applying them by a technique that actually is reasonably easy, now it's reasonably easy after a lot of research, to understand and apply and to generate good materials. So what excites me is uh, the prospect of turning what really has been a laboratory material to date into something that does something useful for somebody somewhere. And I think we really are on the cusp of that. And the work we've been doing kind of takes us a step closer to that. And now as, as Head of Engineering at uh, the University of Cambridge, what skills and aptitude do you think are essential for future engineers? Um, I think number one is the ability to communicate. Uh, also engineers have to have integrity so they need to know a lot about engineering. It's not about one engineering knowing a little bit of electrical engineering and that's it. Uh, engineers work in teams. Uh, I heard it described as hunting in packs. Uh, but um, in a, any major engineering project, there's a whole raft of engineers involved. And if every engineer knows the challenges faced by you know their colleagues, even though they're in, they're in a different discipline, then they can actually plan and design and build in a very efficient way that makes life easy for everybody. So engineers really need to communicate. They need to be able to understand problems, they need to be able to apply what they do and they need to be able to work as part of a team. It's a, a kind of bit of a tall order to ask people to be that good but that's what we need of our engineers and you know, engineering is about the young people between 20 and 35 now who are going to change the world and uh, it's not about dinosaurs like me, it's about them. Now's never been a better time to be an engineer. Uh, the world is facing unprecedented challenges from global warming to an ageing population. Obviously there's a financial crash which gives a different uh, perspective on engineering. But all these bright young people uh, are going to relish the challenge of addressing these problems. And I'm absolutely confident they will. And finally, uh, what words of advice do you have for your fellow graduates today? I, I think believe. If you want to do something badly enough... Uh, then I think you'll get to do it. But one piece of advice is is don't do it at somebody else's expense. There's always a way to get where you want to get 
um, for all the right reasons. And, um, and in my entire career, I've had so much support from so many people. It's uh, quite humbling to think about it. And nobody once has ever trodden on me. And you know, I think it's good advice to, to young people to remember that you can get where you want to by being nice, earning respect and not doing it at somebody else's expense. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.